of all the things that I've done with research ed over the years, one of the things I never thought I'd do is have uh, hundreds of people into my home at 5 a.m. <laughs> and, and if I'm a little caffeinated, it's because I've actually uh, had to drink about a pot of coffee getting ready for this. Um, but I think I'll jump right in. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Um, uh, so we can jump right in. There's quite a lot to cover. Um, but the name of the topic or the name of the, the talk is uh, the swimming pool and the marathon revisited and it has to do with social and emotional learning <clears throat> and kind of some uh, ideas uh, that that I think uh, from an evidence based standpoint are probably good for us to consider uh, in in doing the work that we do. Uh, and a lot of this goes back, it's gonna take some uh, um, explaining. Uh, and I have, I have a few periods for us. Um, let's see, sometimes with the screen sharing, it doesn't switch screens as it should. So there we go. All right, um, I have a few periods to take us through this. Um, uh, first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the swimming pool and the marathon means for folks who might not uh, be familiar with past work or past talks of mine uh, to, to give that some definition. Uh, that should, and each of these periods I'm figuring will be around 10 to 12 minutes. Um, uh, and I'm going to use that to talk about what I'm calling the current social emotional learning over correction. Uh, and that will be, mean a bit more as we, as we move actually into the talk. Uh, and, then, and then talk a little bit about what some of the research insights tell us about what effective social emotional learning is, okay, how it can happen, uh, how it might fit into um, uh, practitioners' uh, consideration as they as they bring together their own um, uh, planning. Um, uh, Going to talk about what that research tells us about perhaps slowing some of the current overcorrection that that we're that we may be experiencing. Um, uh, and then I'm going to spend a little time uh, in light of that research and in light of kind of this idea of the swimming pool and the marathon. Um, uh, just passing on some recommendations about how this effective SEL can happen uh, and things that we might uh, start doing. And it's, and I'll tell you right now, it's, it's more in the form of principles than actions um, because this is a very uh, uh, locally determined uh, best set of, of, of uh, actions to do. Uh, and then finally, uh, hopefully we'll have a little time for Q and A and discussion. I don't know if you've ever seen me speak, <laughs> um, but uh, I tend to be the, uh, uh, pack the presentation a little too full guy. And sometimes we're going right up to time. Uh, my hope is that we'll have a little time for questions uh, and I can say hello to uh, some of the uh, uh, friends I have uh, out there because uh, I, I have been really happy for the support uh, uh, knowing, knowing I'm getting to connect with some people that uh, I, I've had to miss. Uh, now, but jumping right in, um, the first stop in this presentation is the, the swimming pool and the marathon. That takes some explaining. Um, uh, and for that explaining, I'd like to return to my very first research ed talk. Um, this was in the fall of 2015. Uh, I was in London, it was at the National. Um, uh, it was my first trip to London. I was giddy. I, uh, I even did something my, my good pal, Targender Gill, would say is so American of you, Eric. Uh, um, Hi T, if you're out there. Um, uh, I took a picture of the room. I, I had to do it. Uh, so there's the room, and if you glance around in there, you'll see, you know, many people I've very uh, been very fortunate to come to know. Dydow's in there. Weston, I think, uh, Tharby, Stu Locke, Marwood, Amanda Spielman, Daisy Christodoulou. I mean, it was just a great, great thrill for me, and so I could not pass up the opportunity to take a picture of the room. <clears throat> And I'm really glad I did because I have it. Anyway, at the time I was there talking about this book, um, Education is Upside Down, which came out in 2014. That's kind of where this all starts. Uh, and my talk was on this idea of the swimming pool and the marathon. Uh, so I'm going to start there. Um, uh, in Education is Upside Down, uh, chapter six uh, is called How Schools Should Help Children Succeed. And that title comes from a book we'll be hearing a little bit more about as I move through, and that's Paul Tuff's How Children Succeed, uh, which around the time I was writing Education is Upside Down, uh, this book was really making a lot of waves in American education anyway, okay? It had to do with 
um, uh, um, things we should be focusing on instead of the current US reforms, which were very um, academically based. Um, but we'll um, come back to that book in a, in a moment. And basically in chapter six, um, what I moved or, or questioned was this idea of Tufts non-cognitive hypothesis, okay, about teaching character as it's um, kind of the crucial, um, uh, the crucial ingredient to student success. Um, but I kind of brought up in chapter six, um, can we do it, okay? Like what the question of to teach or not to teach character is uh, a big one, okay? And how do you do it? And can you do it? And if you can, which character to teach? Uh, are we uh, working more for empathic students or competitive students? Those kinds of questions are all in chapter six. Um, and then I dove a little bit into the qualities of successful kids, okay? That if you look at what constitutes uh, success in the world beyond K-12, what can you know about your students within K-12 um, uh, to be able to, to predict their success? What qualities do they possess? And then where I could, I tried to apply conclusions to the classroom, practices and messages, that sort of thing. Um, and that was really what that chapter was about. And that's what I focused on in that very first research ed talk. Um, but to return for a second to what is the non-cognitive hypothesis. Um, uh, and I have, there's uh, some, there's a lot of text in here in a couple of places, but I think I need needed to make the points. So apologies if, uh, if I'm breaking effective PowerPoint protocol. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> uh, if you need these slides later, uh, they will be available. And so uh, maybe the text will come in handy. Um, but I wanna talk about what he called his non-cognitive hypothesis in how children succeed. Um, he's a journalist, okay? Um, uh, and basically uh, he predicts kids, he looks at what predicts kids' success in the world beyond schooling and offers that US education reforms aren't concentrating on the right things, okay? Um, uh, and uh, there are phrases in there like this uh, that turned out to be, um, quite influential, <laughs> to, to put it lightly. Um, uh, and I'll just read it out. Uh, in the past decade, many experts have begun to produce evidence that what matters most in a child's development is not how much information we can stuff into her brain, but, what, but whether we are able to help her develop a different set of qualities, a list that includes persistence, self-control, curiosity, conscientiousness, grist, grit, and self-confidence. We sometimes think of them as character, okay? Um, a statement like that has a lot of impact and that kind of leads the book off. Um, and then it goes on to, to, to talk about, and I think make a pretty convincing case for that these things are indeed very important. Uh, and I don't think that's something many people would argue with. Um, but <laughs> when we start looking at the products and actions of the non-cognitive hypothesis, this is where it starts to um, uh, get a little more concerning. Um, at least to me, and at least in the, in the chapter of that book. Um, like for instance, these are some of the things that I, I would pick out around the field and my work around the field, um, uh, that social emotional learning, oh, notice, social emotional learning has gotten a, um, has gotten a brand by now, okay? By when back, back in the day of tough, uh, which is the halcyon days of 2012, you can look through this book and I have my copy right here. I, and I did a quick scan the term social emotional learning isn't even in there. Okay, so in just a few short years, uh, we went from having a term that did not exist to a whole philosophy based on it and a priority to be made out of it that he was just kind of calling character or non-cognitive skills at the time. Anyway, in the intervening years, we started to see social emotional learning prioritized. Okay, it's a required review item, for instance, in New York State's uh, SEDL requirements uh, when they're doing school quality reviews, okay? Uh, and that means social emotional developmental learning uh, in their in their argument. Um, another place you saw it pop up a lot is um, just kind of throughout the field in terms of folks um, uh, attempting to offer good SEL experiences to their students. Uh, you started to see the explicit study of character and non-cognitive skills growing, okay? I, I have a a clip there from 
Ed Dystopia, uh, uh, which has, uh, it's basically a lesson about how to build grit, okay? Uh, a curriculum lesson and, and an explicit um, uh, way to do this. It, it's merely illustrative, uh, a few clicks on the internet and you can see any number of similar lessons. But that was sort of, sort of an explosion in how to build kids grit, their conscientiousness, their communication skills and so forth. Um, also, I uh, started to notice that even around the field, um, uh, students were getting graded on these qualities, okay? Uh, we have a large charter chain here in the, in the States called KIPP, and that's short for the Knowledge is Power program. Uh, they were actually doling out character report cards, okay, where students were graded on things like their, their zest and their grit and their self-control and their ability to self-manage. Uh, uh, to go alongside their, their academic uh, um, readings on their report cards. So th these are just sort of some, some of the things that you started to see around the field, really trying to get at this idea of how do we teach kids character. Um, so th those are just illustrations of the sorts of things you could see. And in my talk back in 2015 and in my book, uh, I said, let's be careful, okay? Because in my view, I felt we were heading for what I call overcorrection. Um, uh, and I'll, and my reasons for being concerned, I'll talk about what overcorrection is in a moment, uh, but my reasons for being concerned was, um, because we're not really certain about how many of these things happen. Okay. Even the experts, um, who study this day and night, um, aren't exactly sure how we, how individuals take on new character traits and new abilities to decide and become more effective, um, just basically livers of life. Uh, some of them would, are still wondering about how it can be successfully taught. And I made an example of uh, um, Angela Duckworth, who's um, uh, uh, the person who's, uh, um, who worked under Walter Michelle and has done a lot of work on delayed self-gratification and that, that led toward the, the idea of grit. Uh, you might be uh, aware of her work. Uh, she put out a piece in 2015 written with uh, David Yeager, basically saying, if we're going to begin to use, t we're going to use these measurements of character to hold teachers accountable to their jobs or schools accountable to the effectiveness of their institution, we should probably really watch that. <laughs> um, uh, and these references, by the way, are all included on the last slide. Uh, when we make those available, if you'd like to look this up. Uh, but she basically said that uh, the way we measure these things is still very much a work in progress. And so to hold people accountable to making them happen is probably premature at best. Um, also, uh, once we start getting into this, this you know, uh, tension over uh, what is most important to teach in school, it can actually kind of obscure what schooling's mission is and its potential as an academic preparation you know, forum. Uh, and I, I found this piece, this was again, back then while I was preparing for the research ed talk uh, by a gentleman named Andrew Hacker who ran in the New York Times, basically an argument that algebra should be removed from the curriculum as a requirement. And uh, with quotes like this in it, saying things like, it's Finnish, South Korean and Polish students' perseverance, not their classroom algebra that fits them for demanding jobs, as in this is a, an either or. So if we're gonna teach something, why don't we get rid of algebra and work instead on better decision-making uh, is effectively the, the case he's making. Um, and then just questioning the all around uh, utility of having algebra in your, in your toolkit if you're a young person. Uh, and then finally, opportunity cost. So when I said uh, uh, back then, when I was talking about urging caution is all of this leads up to if we spend many, many hours on developing teachers to be better deliverers and designers of social emotional learning, um, something's going to have to go. Uh, and because uh, we can't do it all. So that, to me, that was another big reason to really urge caution. Uh, and this whole idea of overcorrection, what it is uh, in general, uh, here's my quick primer on it. And, and for this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a video, so I don't know exactly how well this will go. Um, I hope it turns out, because uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a good analog for um, exactly what I'm talking about. Now, <clears throat> what you're about to see, this is a training video that 
uh, is shown to drivers in my state. I live in Minnesota uh, and our winters can produce uh, driving conditions that are treacherous, okay, to say the least. Uh, you can have entire sheets of ice um, uh, on the road and so you have to learn how to deal with those things. And this is the sort of thing they may train you to do in your driver's training. Um, so just sit tight, it's, it's, a, it's a minimal. And I show that video uh, to show that's what I mean by overcorrection, okay? Because in education, we have a tendency when we hit a slick surface, sometimes to do the wrong thing, okay? Uh, and I would move that uh, Paul Tufts book uh, back in 2012, uh, kind of sent us into attempting to do the to overdo something and it sent us into a spin. And it just all just sort of say, here's what it is, okay? Like if we were taking apart what overcorrection can be within education or shoot behind the wheel on an icy surface, it's any severe abrupt reaction to an identified challenge, okay? So anything we do um, uh, to attempt to get ourselves out of that challenge uh, would be considered an overcorrection. Uh, usually, these are executed before the challenge is thoroughly understood. Okay, so we didn't know all the moving parts, but we were we were so overcome by the nature of the challenge and the and the promise of what seemed like the 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 best thing to do that uh, we chose the wrong course. <laughs> um, and we execute those corrections with insufficient consideration of the actual best course. Okay, uh, in and though I don't know how many of you all watching. Uh, would know what better to do if you start to uh, slide okay, on a very slick surface, but there are other options available, like pump your brakes, don't slam on your brakes. Okay, pump your brakes to slow yourself down and give yourself some traction, then attempt the turn again, but do not quickly overcorrect this way or you will spin and spin. Um, uh, similarly in education, sometimes we don't choose the best course when we hear, uh, oh, you know, when we find ourselves in that challenge in that moment of challenge. Uh, and it ultimately results in spin. It interferes with our positive progress. So instead of moving forward, we kind of spin around in this same place. Um, and I've moved that in, a, in education. We've made several, several moves uh, over decades uh, in which our overcorrections impeded our forward movement uh, to really do the best work for kids. Uh, and sometimes uh, it can get really bad. It can just cause an outright wreck, okay? <laughs> um, uh, really terrible things can happen sometimes if, uh, in overcorrection, including uh, behind the wheel of a car on an icy road in Minnesota, uh, flipping all the way over, okay? And so uh, uh, certain things can happen uh, in these overcorrections that, that we try to avoid. And so I was basically saying uh, uh, several years ago, uh, let's look out for one of these overcorrections. It seems like we might be heading for. Um, and so that's what I was effectively arguing uh, in chapter six of Ed is Upside Down and uh, in my visit to London uh, five years ago. Now, also though, I offered in that chapter, um, here's maybe how we should think about it instead. Uh, first of all, we can't think of this as an either or. That's when we're, that's when we're really, um, making the hard turn away from the spin uh, that's going to send us into, uh, uh, you know, no movement forward. Uh, kids must grow, grow cognitively and non-cognitively. To put it as though you are going to interrupt cognitive development and academic preparation for uh, students' non-cognitive um, strength, it's really a no-win situation for those children. Um, and I said, this is no way a new idea, okay? Education for generations uh, has been built on this idea, okay? Classical education, for example, uh, does not just put academic um, 
uh, preparation at its at the met, at the middle of its mission. Uh, you learn the things you do in the sequence you do to develop the person. Okay, W. T. Harris was an American educationalist uh, working in the early days of public education, and he called the academic subjects the windows of the soul. These are the uh, uh, the things that uh, we do to become uh, prepared for the institutions we are to join after our schooling. Uh, and I, I thought I found this quote from uh, again early in the 20th century uh, by a, 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 a Jesuit educator who said, "Schooling's aim is the man, not the specialist." Okay, that that it is the academics that actually grow us as people. Uh, and so the, this idea of intertwined, it's, this was not something I came up with. It's, it's something that, that has been long in the uh, tradition of American education until folks started uh, insisting on breaking them apart. Um, and basically what I say in chapter six uh, of Ed is Upside Down is ideally, we would view them as intertwined, okay? To use academic experiences and leverage them to build kids' non-cognitive strength. Okay. And uh, that's what leads to uh, all of that prelude is what leads to this metaphor of the marathon and the swimming pool. Okay. So the marathon, and this is how I, I, I put it in the book. Uh, uh, the marathon is this exercise we're preparing all children for. Okay. They're going to have to join many, many, many other of their peers uh, and competitors out in this very demanding uh, test. Uh, a test of will, a uh, test of stamina, uh, a test of the mind, okay? Um, and we're gonna have to prepare them all for the same one. They're gonna have to jump into the same race. The catch with education is that we're given a swimming pool to train them in, okay? So we can, we can never fully replicate the conditions of the marathon in the setting we're given to prepare them, okay? And in our forum, in our venue, uh, they must uh, learn different skills, okay? They must learn, you know, abstract math. They must learn grammar. They must learn facts about history they may never use again, but all of those things are actually, uh, if done right, uh, great preparation for this marathon, okay? Uh, if you never get in a pool to build stamina, mental toughness, and appreciation for the economy of movement, and so on and so forth, uh, you will be that much further behind in your preparation for the marathon. So it's basically like um, uh, using the swimming pool to provide it, that even though it can't replicate the exact conditions of the marathon, uh, to use it as a, a, an effective um, uh, resistance medium uh, that can actually build your marathon type strength. Okay. Uh, and in addition, they're, they're learning to be good swimmers or uh, good at academics as well, uh, which could come in handy, I don't know. Um, so that's what the swimming pool and the marathon is. Um, and I know that's a rather uh, lengthy introduction, but it will come up again. Um, now, moving into the next piece here, um, uh, how all that relates to what I'm calling the current social emotional learning overcorrection. Um, uh, if back in 2012, to 15, I was a little concerned about what I saw us heading into. I'd say we're fully there now, okay? Uh, you have people um, uh, saying that you have to table the academics for the, <laughs> for the, uh, for the non-academic uh, because that's what's really important. Uh, um, Tufts urgings uh, basically came true, okay? Now, I find this a little interesting um, uh, and I have to touch on this a little bit. Uh, in 2016, uh, Paul Tuff wrote another book, uh, and it was called Helping Children Succeed, What Works and Why. Um, and again, I have quite a bit of text to read out, but I think it's, uh, it's instructive. Uh, and he said, uh, but in my reporting for How Children Succeed, I noticed a strange paradox. Many of the educators I encountered who seemed best able to engender non-cognitive abilities in their students never said a word about these skills in the classroom. And yet, in all the time I spent watching her teach, this is another passage there, I never once heard exemplar teacher Elizabeth Spiegel use words like grit or character or self-control. She talked to her students only about chess. Okay, she was a chess coach. And so, um, Tuff is, is on to something here. Uh, uh, 
She didn't even really give them pep talks or motivational speeches. Instead, her main pedagogical technique was to intensely analyze their games with them, talking frankly and in detail about the mistakes they had made, helping them see what they could have done differently. Something in her caref careful and close attention to her students' work changed not only their chess ability, but also their approach to life. Uh, so Paul Tuff, four years on from uh, uh, How Children Succeed, um, uh, comes to this realization that funny, the people who build these non-cognitive skills so well, or do social emotional learning so well, uh, actually never mention these things, okay? They, they just, the kid's character grows through the experience of doing these things in a disciplined way. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a handy time for you to come to that realization, man. Uh, we have schools getting reviewed on whether they can do this well. But anyway, um, uh, we're in overcorrection. Uh, uh, also, from elsewhere in the non-cognitive universe, uh, a person I think many of us know, uh, uh, Carol Dweck, uh, the mindset guru. Um, uh, she works, well, she works with the most elusive and beautiful of all social and emotional qualities, the growth mindset. Um, uh, and in her work, uh, <laughs> after many of us attempted to put posters on the walls and tell kids their brains were like muscles and uh, uh, show famous failures videos and, and noticing that they didn't necessarily develop a growth mindset. And we can't always get your studies to replicate, Carol. Uh, she said herself uh, uh, in kind of this, you know, um, rethink uh, and seeing how the, the how practitioners uh, uh, maybe weren't getting it fully. Um, she said, it's not about teaching the concept alone. It's much more about implementing practices that focus on growth and learning. Growth mindset is about embodying it in all the everyday practices that educators do, presenting material with students understanding that you think they can all learn it to a high level, giving them feedback on their learning processes. It's about helping children to relish challenges because the challenges can help them grow their abilities. Okay, in other words, um, you can't necessarily, uh, her admission is that you can't necessarily build growth mindset um, by telling kids about it. Okay, so explicitly teaching it is maybe not, maybe not the, the most high yield strategy. Um, and and fairly, uh, fairly to Ms. Dweck, uh, Dr. Dweck, um, uh, the, um, the corrective tour that she's on, I think shows a lot of uh, intellectual integrity. Um, uh, once she saw how the field handled it, uh, she has committed to doing better on this and, and, and maybe going back on some of the, the early promises that she made. And I think that is, is a somewhat rare quality um, in, in folks. Some, she could have disappeared and never, and we never saw her again. Uh, and she could have just said, you're all doing it wrong, but she's committed to helping us figure it out. And I, I'm trusting that we'll, we'll get a little better handle on that going forward. Uh, anyway. That said, if we look at the words of Dweck and the, the, the qualification from Tuff, maybe you're saying that this is how social emotional learning happens, um, uh, that it happens through the, the experiences students go through, not necessarily the instruction they receive, <clears throat> which again, I, I have a metaphor for, but like I say, it's an age old idea. Um, uh, it seems like the folks that uh, that look at this from journalists to uh, researchers uh, may, may be hitting on that exact same thing. And that's a worthwhile lesson for us to take before we overcorrect is the entire point. Um, now, the sad part is that the ship has sailed. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we, may have un we may have misunderstood it as a field, uh, but we're already very much in the progress of, of, of trying to do this um, our preferred way, uh, no matter what the researchers say. Uh, um, so uh, I can tell you that across US education, and I know uh, at this hour of day, there aren't many US educators here, um, but at the, uh, in US education, I can tell you without a doubt that loads of resources are being spent on explicitly developing social and emotional learning interventions. Okay, uh, and, and really believing it and in it as something that needs to be prioritized and done better. Okay, 
uh, often in the wrong ways. Um, uh, we have national commissions. Uh, here's uh, an issue brief by Penn State funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Here's the Aspen Institute who formed a commission of uh, a couple dozen uh, psychological researchers and educators and education leaders and said, here's how we're gonna do social emotional learning going forward and issued recommendations. Um, we have my state. This is just a clip from the, uh, uh, the State Department of Education's website. Uh, you can see it is social emotional learning implementation guidance. Um, <clears throat> where basically a team of folks that I was on, by the way, <laughs> a team of folks came together uh, to talk to, uh, uh, to basically draw up guidance for when you're improving your social emotional learning offerings in your school, here's how you like work it into your school fabric. Um, uh, it's just everywhere, okay? And I'm just pulling out purely illustrative um, uh, examples. Uh, but uh, again, a few clicks on the internet, uh, and it's not hard to see that this is very top of mind, uh, at least here. Oh, and I can see in my window that the sun is starting to come up. Uh, it's kind of nice. Now, um, also, uh, this ship has sailed in terms of the practices that, that folks are attempting to do. Okay, so we're not just talking about the, the guidance and requirements that are being kind of rolled into place. Um, but the types of interventions that folks are investing time and energy into uh, are kind of of those uh, uh, weak evidence-based varieties or no evidence base, uh, and often they offer little practical. Uh, uh, they offer little more practical value uh, than that. The secret ingredient is love. Okay, uh, to build students social and socially and emotionally, um, we need to love them harder. Okay, it just it gets reduced to that many, many times across the enterprise, probably because it's a lot harder to build than uh, than might be given proper credit for, as even the researchers have said. But to give you some examples of what I mean by that, when I say uh, um, interventions that are uh, based on the idea that the secret ingredient is love, uh, I really mean relationships. Okay. Uh, uh, so many of our social emotional adjustments are coming down to the power of relationships. Uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Okay. But again, it's not properly understood what this means. And you sometimes get over reductions of, of that idea. Uh, I'm going to show a, this meme will probably be familiar to any um, uh, uh, educator working in the US. I've seen it on more walls than I can count. Uh, across the country. It's uh, the late Rita Pearson uh, who gave a TED talk about how children need a champion. And the TED talk has much more depth in it and much more nuance than this quote does. Uh, but that's the quote that folks love to pick out from it and put next to her face uh, is kids don't learn from people they don't like. Okay. And so, you know, internalize that educators. Now, <laughs> um, uh, uh, adjust your classroom demeanor accordingly. Um, uh, uh, so anyway, but it, it's just the sort of underscore to the sort of thing that you are commonly seeing in the US is how do we get them to have more loving relationships? Uh, I found this uh, also, I was just kind of looking around for who's offering this sort of uh, professional development on being better at relationships. And I found this company, uh, uh, and I just thought this statement was was really uh, instructive. Uh, this is from a, a company called Fuel Ed, and they actually um, uh, go and give professional development to people about how they can build more secure attachments as teachers. Okay, so not you know make their science curriculum uh, more knowledge rich, not approach early reading with a uh, a sound basis in, in uh, phonics and so on, but how to build secure attachments with your children. Um, and uh, this quote, she said, uh, this person says, uh, uh, developing SEL competencies in students is not as simple as equip equipping educators with a curriculum on grit or a scope and sequence on self-control, namely because social emotional competencies are not learned like other cognitive skills. Now I'm like, looking good. That's actually looking pretty good so far, okay? And then it takes this left turn to, 
There are no lesson plans, activities, or programs that will ever match the power of a teacher's warmth, empathic understanding, acceptance, and honest communication. Okay, so I'm like, okay, so don't give them activities because it doesn't work. You're yeah, right on. Um, uh, but now how, do, how will we develop them? Just by being super warm to them. Uh, and being better communicators. Uh, I was like, ah, so, but these, I, and then I'm showing them as illustrations of the sorts of things uh, you can see pretty commonly in the, in the US uh, SEL development culture. And just relatedly, uh, we see a lot of discipline policies today are being based on this idea of restorative practices. This is a, this is a very relationship building based uh, uh, philosophy, which is uh, uh, taking consequences out in many ways uh, uh, to make sure that students are taught to restore, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of violations to another student or school policy. Um, that's very much about maintaining relationships and strengthening relationships. Uh, we're seeing increased focus on unstructured playtime mindfulness programs, like just really helping kids self-regulate and communicate. Uh, those are becoming uh, um, trained more and more often uh, across, across our country anyway. Uh, an idea called trauma-informed instruction, uh, which is basically based on the idea of adverse childhood experiences, uh, understanding the traumas that students may have faced, understanding that it may have uh, interfered with their development, uh, their social emotional development, and that's affecting their academic progress, um, just et cetera. Okay, uh, and again, I cannot speak to what it's like internationally, but in being in a lot of US schools and talking to a lot of US educators, I know that this has been a prime focus of their buildings in recent years, uh, meaning that's where a lot of the resources are going uh, in, a, in an attempt to build these strengths in their practitioners. Um, and if, if uh, if back in 2015, I was warning against overcorrection, I, I, I think we're in it, okay, is, what I, is I guess what I'm saying. Uh, important notice before I move forward. Um, the above discussion is not discounting the importance of student social and emotional development, okay? So before you think that Eric is a child-hating um, uh, 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 proponent of purely academics, back to basics all the time, I really need you to stop. <laughs> okay. In no way am I saying these are not important. Okay. I am saying though that if we are committing to effective social emotional learning in our students, we should seek practices and approaches that have evidence to support them. Okay. And a lot of the um, more sentimental approaches like love them harder um, have not been uh, the most high yield strategies. Okay, uh, and I think the, you know, the, the evidence kind of bears that out. And then the good news is that there are some uh, folks that are studying social emotional learning and the growing of personal qualities and how that happens that we can actually start to apply to uh, our practices uh, that should give us hope because uh, um, uh, we do know that that character, okay, or social emotional health can be built. Um, and so now I just want to talk a little bit about some folks who are, or some things that I think are, are hopeful when it comes to slowing this overcorrection into the secret ingredient is love, um, uh, which again has not returned very much historically. Um, now, uh, here's some promising things that I, I think I've seen out there. Uh, um, and, I, and I'll just begin with. Uh, People like Carol Dweck and her kind of corrective tour that's gone on the last few years. Um, uh, the more the researchers are watching how practitioners are putting these things in place, and the more cash that is flooding that space to do this well, some really good research uh, from developmental psychology uh, should pop out. Okay, and I would say it already has. Um, uh, and so, like. I do think we're seeing some, some good stuff, okay? It's just a matter of kind of finding it. And though I'm not gonna dive terribly deep into it because we're, we're down to about 20 minutes already, um, I will give you some folks that I think you should know. Uh, and once you go in there, uh, the links will take you down the rabbit hole. So uh, enjoy. 
um, is Retta Hammond. Uh, uh, here's is someone that I find I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to know about the work uh, that Ms. Hammond is doing. Uh, she's this author of, of a book called Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. Um, she is a very well respected and, and very highly demanded uh, 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 provider of professional development. Uh, I know in the Twin Cities area, um, I am regularly in conversations with people who have, who have sit in her, been to her trainings, have read her book, things like that. Uh, she sends a really powerful message uh, uh, saying that relationships are not the only thing. Uh, and, and there was a, a interview she gave uh, recently uh, last year, two years ago, uh, to Cult of Pedagogy, uh, which is a, a website here by a woman named Jennifer Gonzalez. Uh, and uh, again, I'll read this quote out. She said, there's a big effort afoot in terms of social emotional learning programs, trying to help students gain self-regulation and build positive relationships with students. And after a few years of this kind of work, their positive climate has gone up, satisfaction sur surveys among adults as well as the kids are really high, but the achievement doesn't move. Okay, so the trusting relationship is just one part, not the part. It is the on-ramp to the thinking we want students to do. I see a lot of people just doing the relationship piece, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly, <laughs> that uh, schools table a lot of development in their folks and prioritize relationships, sometimes at the expense of other things uh, that could be helping their kids. Yes, also social emotionally. Um, uh, so I, I just, I put those, uh, that quote in there from uh, Ms. Hammond, just because I think it's incredibly powerful and dead on. Uh, and, and I'm happy that that message is out there. Uh, similarly, um, we're seeing uh, research actually cor uh, correcting some of our misconceptions and oversimplifications. Uh, buried in the middle of the coronavirus outbreak, um, a, I thought a pretty major thing came along in late March of just this year, uh, um, where this idea of adverse childhood experiences, uh, I, I referenced it late, uh, earlier about uh, in relation to uh, 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 trauma-informed instruction. Um, the authors of that idea, okay, adverse childhood experiences and that you could like gather a score from children and then plan according to that score and things like that. Um, the folks that made that actually put a paper out in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine back in uh, late March saying, hey, field, okay, not just education field, but medical field as well. Um, uh, you are overdoing what is very is a very crude measurement, okay, like that we haven't fully understood how trauma affects different people, okay? So for you to be just measuring how many ACEs a kid has and then acting accordingly uh, is, is again, premature at best, you know? And I, I just thought like uh, findings like that, um, uh, researchers who are committing to helping us not go too far in before we commit all kinds of resources is very helpful. Uh, uh, will it see the you know light of day? Will will that revised information actually hit teachers? I guess that's tough to say, but uh, that's kind of on us, right? Uh, us practitioners. Uh, also, there is just plain better research going into uh, what is actually going on inside a person, socially and emotionally. Okay, um, uh, and we have to trust that that's going to happen. Uh, Search Institute. Uh, it's a, a Twin Cities based. Uh, applied research firm. I worked for them for three years. Uh, I think they're doing a lot of promising work in this idea of what is a relationship. Okay, so in the relationships that help people grow, what can we ask those people and understand, you know, in a very deep and involved way? What did you experience? Okay, and, and I think they have uh, in the developmental relationships framework, uh, and again, I've, I've seen a lot of folks reduce it uh, too far. Uh, but I think it's an actually uh, uh, kind of a promising way to think about relationships. Uh, it's a way that I say you can divide and conquer relationships. Uh, it's got five elements uh, that, that say, uh, you know, these are the things that when people look back on their experiences of, of having grown and someone who could help them through that, here are the things those people did for them in different measure. Um, uh, I think it's, a, a, it's got a lot of promise. Uh, so these are the sorts of ideas that I think are emerging more and more all the time uh, to hopefully give us a little bit of 
uh, a more measured response. And again, not to continue this overcorrection. Um, uh, and on that note, um, uh, there's a name I would recommend you know, and that's David Yeager. Um, uh, and I'm only going to get to give a quick uh, uh, summary of what, what I think is so um, uh, um, promising about the work of Mr. Yeager, Dr. Yeager. Um, uh, he's a developmental psychologist, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he works and has worked for a long time about what sticks in kids' character. Okay, so like why, why do they decide as they do? Uh, what makes them change some of their habits from being uh, less healthy decision makers to more healthy decision makers and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know because I've only spoken with him a couple of times and I was to try to get him to speak at Research Ed, by the way. Um, uh, his work seems to me, his research questions seem to me to be heavily informed by his time as a high school teacher. Okay, there are things he asks about adolescents that, that I think are potentially quite powerful for our field. Um, uh, and anyway, some select research insights that you will see um, from his work. Uh, he points out that there are huge differences between how young children and adolescents make choices and why. Uh, and he also says that these should have great bearing on the SEL approaches we choose. Okay, so um, uh, there are things we know we can do with younger students just by dint of their psychology and development that we can't necessarily pull off with older students. Okay, and that's not a flaw in our delivery necessarily. It's simply who they are as people. Um, and you can read a lot more um, uh, if you look into some of his work. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, more specifically, for adolescents, the SEL practices at work, they're less about teaching SEL skills and more about motivating students in terms of the values that matter most to them. Uh, and that's incredibly important. Um, uh, uh, Moving folks through their values is is a, a key theme of everything that that Jaeger does. Uh, I reference to a, a paper of his called "Boring but Important," uh, and it's about creating a self-transcendent purpose for learning. Okay, uh, where he talks about really think about what you're doing, uh, and you have your reasons for doing it, and it's boring but it's important. Now you have to appeal to the students in terms of their values. Um, uh, I think it's a uh, it's got it's got promise. Uh, I I do urge you to check it out, and and he explains it uh, in much more detail. Now, uh, I thought this quote from from him in Scientific American back in 2016 was also a good one, uh, and a good one for us to always keep in mind, especially when we're talking about working with adolescent SEL. He said the question of whether character can be learned is unambiguously yes but our unintentional efforts are far less successful than our unintentional ones, okay? As in, uh, we can change kids' character. That's what he has, um, sorry, and, I, and character I use loosely. Um, uh, I think it's a little loaded as a term, but that's his words. Um, we can change their habits, their behaviors, their mindsets, okay? But the things that work are the things that feel to them as though we weren't trying to do them, if that makes sense. Um, and I have another quick video. This is just a little 90 second video and I know we're coming down to time here, um, but, uh, and, I, and I hope this works. Uh, here's what he had to say about his own work. Hear it, um, Eric. Eric, we couldn't hear that.
Okay, so essentially, uh, Sorry, once again, Aaron, can I just? Yes. Just say, we we couldn't hear the video, unfortunately. Oh. Darn. Uh, uh, if you, uh, I'm sorry you couldn't hear it. Um, uh, there is a YouTube link at the bottom of this. I will make sure. I don't. I don't know exactly how we get that up. Essentially, what he says is from his research, and, and I'll just I'll sum it up. Thanks, Helen. Um, uh, uh, HQ. Uh, um, essentially, what he said was what we're finding out from our research uh, is that separating separating the, the teaching of these skills and, and teaching purpose as its own self-contained unit is probably a, a pretty low, you know, return strategy, especially when working with adolescents. So once again, you see, it seems to re-invoke this idea of the swimming pool and the marathon. How can your SEL be baked into uh, the work you do through the, the typical work of academics? Um, uh, is really what is, is really the overall message he sent. And again, uh, I, I urge you to just check out these slides. I'll put them on my blog and um, and, and I don't know how Red Home is getting those out, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, and I'm, I apologize for that. Now, very finally, uh, uh, and, and we've had, uh, I've gone through a lot of things here. Uh, uh, so I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, you staying with me. I, though there's only a few minutes left, I think I can kind of get through uh, uh, the the sorts of things I'd like to say in light of all of this, okay? If there is this thing called the swimming pool in the marathon, okay, it's a way of looking at effective SEL that I hope can help us slow our current SEL um, uh, overcorrection and, and kind of like reliance on, on just purely sentimental approaches to building students uh, socially and emotionally. And that's uh, effective uh, research is emerging all the time about how people develop and how we might stand an actual chance of helping that happen for kids. Um, these are some recommendations I'd make now. And, uh, and then with a little bit of a um, uh, addendum as far as how we should maybe think about doing them from a distance. Um, my first recommendation is prioritize. Okay, uh, this is as somebody that's implemented these programs in my schools, uh, I worked with people as um, uh, and improvement specialist, things like that, because when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority, okay? And when we think of the social emotional development of kids, I can lean on this, uh, the wheel from CASEL, and CASEL is the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning. In the U.S., uh, they come up very often in SEL discussions because they're kind of defining the game. Uh, if you look at that wheel, it contains everything. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making. It's so much stuff that if we don't prioritize in some way and really focus on what we want to get better at with our kids, it's going to be very hard for us to develop all those things in all of them, okay, who come from a multitude of different backgrounds and realities. Um, uh, I like what uh, developmental psychologist Hunter Gelbach said in Ed Week uh, a few years ago. He said, we might start by distilling social emotional learning. If we separated the nice to know domains from those that teachers must know deeply, wouldn't we be left with those capacities that are truly fundamental? Okay. And I propose, therefore, we focus primarily on their social connectedness, motivation, and self-regulation. You may disagree. Okay, uh, in your school, you may believe the thing your kids need most is a, a sense of uh, uh, becoming better relators or communicators. And I'm saying that's fine. Okay, I may not agree. Okay, but I don't know your kids. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just saying, when it comes to what you're actually going to target, please prioritize first. Um, uh, another one that I would say in light of and, and just kind of in consideration of this idea of the swimming pool and the marathon is figure out how once you know what you'd like to improve, how can you incorporate it into your policies, messages, and expectations, okay? Perhaps less than bringing on a program to do it, okay? And especially true if you're working with adolescents. And by uh, early adolescence, by the way, starts at, uh, and it's arguable where the line is, okay? But think of, of like uh, uh, 10, uh, 11 to 13 as early adolescence and 14 to 18 as middle adolescence. Um, uh, younger children, a little bit differently, okay? But older children do think especially about how you can make it happen uh, within your um, 
messages and expectations. And I, I'll bring up my second book, uh, which just came out about a year ago, What the Academy Taught Us. Uh, that refers to the sophomore academy. This was a school within a school for at-risk 10th graders. Our team in that book, it describes how we built our guiding values to, to kind of work with these kids who uh, were coming to school a little bit behind the eight ball and how we worked all the time to frame and reinforce those values. Okay, it, it was through policies and through our consistent messaging that we got our social emotional work with them done. Um, we had a consistent priority. Our whole point was we wanted to make kids get stable. We wanted to stabilize them, but we were constantly pushing them toward being able. Okay, at some point we had to be able to take away the scaffolds of I'm your person. Okay, you won't always have me. Okay, so we had to take away the scaffolds. We had to take away the additional T of time, but moving kids from stable to able all the time. Um, and this required constant reflection and reaction. Okay, every single year was a little bit different because the constitution of the class was so different. Uh, um, and we had to stay in constant contact. I think these are some of the ways to uh, think about it. And then finally, my third recommendation is to figure out on the front end, how to know if you're succeeding or not. Okay, like have ways to, to measure your progress. Okay, uh, and, and again, I'll, I'll stick with, with things uh, from this book or examples. Um, we went beyond just measuring student attitudes because self-report data can lead you to a lot of wrong conclusions sometimes. So we came up with knowing how we were actually pushing attitudes, shaping them or not. Okay, uh, through other means. Okay, and, and again, in the book, it goes into more detail about that. And I just kind of make a note as from an improvement standpoint, this is an issue for your school's planning stage, not when you're already in operation. Okay, so if you're thinking of instituting a new policy that you're hoping is going to shape uh, uh, student attitudes and mindsets, uh, think back here about how you're going to measure the, the effectiveness of that later. Okay, not necessarily uh, while it's in motion, that may be too late. Uh, and plus your, your means of assessing that can actually form what you do. Uh, finally, uh, and this is the last point, and I know we're not gonna have any time for discussion. I told you it might be that way. Um, uh, I wanna talk a tiny bit about SEL from what I call a disastance. And then, and I mean, in our current paradigm, yes, we're, we're now distance teachers, folks. Okay, but this is also a disaster. Okay, <laughs> like this is a, uh, uh, we're not just online teaching, uh, we're reacting to a very real, um, uh, 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 I don't know, disaster in our midst and kids are in homes that are uh, in all kinds of fluxes because of it and I call that disastance learning. Okay, um, I would love to just think we are being distance teachers now and, and trying to figure these things out, but we also have to keep in mind that we are in the middle of something that's overturning people's lives. Uh, and it may sound a little uh, non-committal, but I'm, I'm not gonna make a ton of recommendations this way. I would just kind of say, in principle, know what your kids need and honor your mission. In the US, we have people wondering if it's ethical to keep grading kids during this time. Uh, Seattle Public Schools, which serves dozens of thousands of students, uh, instituted a grading policy, which was like, you get an A or it's an incomplete. San Francisco, is, off, is thinking of giving everyone an A, okay? Everyone. Um, uh, uh, if you know the book by Robert Pondicio about Success Academy, you know that there's a, a, a very successful school chain out there that does things counter to that. They very actively said, nope, we're keeping our letter grades. That's part of the social and emotional development. We want our kids to, to you know, be taking on at this time to realize that their responsibility as, as learners, even in this time, is not just forfeited. Uh, um, uh, so we see fights like that over, uh, you know, or tension over that right now uh, in our midst for sure. And so this is my school, this is the teachers from my school. This is one of the little like nice outreach things we do. Uh, uh, you know, we send things out, we stay in touch with our families, we do all kinds of uh, uh, events and things like that uh, to maintain outreach, but we're also just kind of letting our families lead. We don't know how much of our support or our contact they want outside of the required um, uh, kind of state uh, guidance on, on what must happen educationally right now. So we're constantly asking them what they want 
and that's letting work and, and, and letting that guide how we go about how much SEL support we provide. Um, we have increased some flexibility with tasks for sure, but our expectations uh -huh. remain and we are planning to grade. Okay, um, uh, we don't want to let up on this idea that it's important. And we just think that this moment has great potential um, to teach about responsibility, even in a disaster. So that's kind of our approach. Uh, I wish I had a more rock solid um, uh, set of recommendations, but you know your kids better than I do. So uh, with that, um, we're kind of at the last period uh, and over time, I believe here, I've got to check my phone. Oh, yes. So sorry, Helen. Okay, just slightly. <laughs> yeah. But, um... No, that was that was really quite interesting. Um, just just one quick question, perhaps. Um, do you get a sense? And I know you're based in the US, but do you get a sense of where we are in the UK in terms of overcorrection, or not? Um, I did. I poked around a little bit and uh, uh, to see just how you know prevalent like the terms about social emotional learning were. Uh, I noticed that that it is a focus. Um, uh, for sure, I saw um, some things on the uh, EEF about uh, guidance and things like that. I can't pretend to know that I, uh, uh, to know about what it's like on the ground as much as I do here. Um, I, uh, my guess would be, and again, and uh, purely informed by conversations with folks on things like social media, uh, I get a little bit of an idea of, of how much some of the messaging is changing um but no not beyond that so i hope it was at all useful <laughs> because i was speaking really about our own uh in my own uh context but uh i don't know perhaps you could I, I tell think, me a little bit more i think if you've been in the system for for a while yeah you will you know we, we've certainly experienced something very similar and i think that you're right the, the dialogue is changing at the moment uh, particularly with the focus on on curriculum which in itself has as triggered you know more debates about um, the importance of one over the other and whether we're overcorrecting or not so I, I found this really uh, really quite insightful um, and certainly uh, once this goes on on YouTube it'd be quite interesting to see uh, what people have to say about yeah, that. right okay well thank you very much for your time uh, yes you're gonna be a bit tired today I think yeah yeah I'm gonna I have, I have, <laughs> so well, go and rest, have, some I have coffee. to get I have to get on to other stuff now so Okay. Now, that, now that the sun's out. All right. Well, enjoy your day, Eric. Thanks. You Thank too. Thank you very much. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Helen. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Right, everyone. Uh, so tomorrow uh, at